Um, if anybody has any questions while I'm lecturing, please put them in the chat, and I check the chat every couple of minutes. Afterwards, we will open up the mics, and you guys can ask any questions that you want, in case, especially um, about the project, which is coming up very soon. And this week, well, next week you're going to kind of you're going to have to turn in almost a mini project, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So tonight we're talking about data structures, um, lists, and dictionaries. Lists and dictionaries are the two structures that are provided by Python. And they're very handy. Um, a lot of programming languages do not provide a dictionary. You have to write, you have to implement your own. Python gives you a dictionary and it's very, very handy. Now, what do I mean by a data structure? A data structure is just a collection of stuff. That's all it is. And it can be whatever stuff you want. It could be rooms for a game. It can be items for a game. You may want to store the weather data. Maybe you're, you're a weather enthusiast. You want to keep track of the weather data and create a Python program for it. So you can group it together. And you can group it in two ways. One that is um, very basic but very fast. Um, the other one you can imbue meaning to your data by what you do, by, by how you set that structure up. Um, and in the programming world, you're going to use a lot of data structures. It's just, that's the way it is. I was, um, whether that data structure is a simple data structure or a very complex data structure, whether it's a flat data structure or a nested data structure, you will use data structures all of the time. They're like loops and branches. They are just part and parcel to what we do. So what are these two data structures that Python gives us? There's list and a dictionary. A list, and, and these, these have specific properties. So a list has, a list is ordered, it's mutable, and it has an index. So ordered means just that. You have things in an order, one after the other. They're kept in that order by the index value. Just like we talked about lists very very slightly a little bit ago, and we've talked about strings extensively. Strings are, in fact, a list of characters. Now, strings, you can't change them. You have to create a new string from an old string with the change in it. A standard list, you can change, and that's what mutable means. It means you can change the values. You can change the length. You can change a value inside of it. Um, dictionaries, on the other hand, are not ordered. They have what are called key value pairs. And so you will give it a key, and that key will have some meaning, and then a value associated with that key. They are also mutable they can be changed. You can do all of, on both lists and dictionaries, you can create, read, update, and delete, and we are going to talk about that. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on basic lists because we've done a lot of it with strings. I am going to concentrate more on multidimensional lists because you're going to have to do some of that this week in the labs. And I'm also going to um, concentrate more on the dictionary because you're going to have to use a dictionary for your game. And in fact, for the project, the, the Dragon game that you're turning in this coming week, you're going to have to use a dictionary. So we've got some new symbols. And the first symbol is kind of a new symbol. We've seen it before when we're dealing with a list or when we're getting a character out of a string. We've got the open and close square brackets. They tell Python that an element is in, is, well, they tell Python to expect 
some element for some collection. And they tell Python, if you're using them on an assignment, that you are expecting a list. So that, those symbols are overloaded, and it can become a little bit confusing to some students. But just know that they always represent the fact that you are either creating a list or accessing information, getting at information inside of a collection. And I didn't say list there specifically because you will use the open and square brackets to get at information in a list, in a list and get at information in a dictionary. Additionally, you will, we have the curly braces, the open and close curly braces. Those are specifically used with dictionaries and they allow us to create a dictionary. That's what they do. But getting at information in a dictionary, you use the square brackets. I'm going to say that a couple times. I'm going to sound like a broken record. Um, but I think it's one of those sticking points with students where it, it's, it's almost a context shift that you have to make to realize that when you want to get at a piece of information, it's always the square brackets. When you want to create a list, it's square brackets. When you want to create a dictionary, it's curly brackets. So we're going to talk a little bit about CRUD. Create, read, update, delete. Lists and dictionaries both support, fully support CRUD. So for a list, we have create, read, update, and delete. And basically, you create a list like we've created them in the past. You can use the open and close square brackets to create an empty list. You can create a populated list by adding data to the open and close square brackets. So how do I read data or get at the data in a list? Well, I use the square brackets again, and I use that index. We've used this in strings, and we used a little bit when we've talked about um, the small amount we've talked about lists. But the concept is identical. Instead of getting a character out of a string, you're getting the whole string, or you're getting an integer, or you're getting a float. But that's how you get at the data, is to use those square brackets and the index. And with lists, always remember, just like any list, whether it's a string or not, the first, the index of the first element is always zero. Okay, and you can also access it in a loop by simply using the in operator. The for loop with an in operator with the, the name of the list to the right-hand side of the in operator will simply just get you every element in a list. It makes it very handy. Update, I can change things, okay? I want to change the second element in my list to pi, or I want to add an element to the end of the list. So I'm going to add 42 to the end of the list. So that's updating. And Python has a lot of methods that you can use to modify your list, including, uh, I think it's pop, there's several others. but. Python, I put down here the URL for Python data structures, and it is very handy if you want to go out and look at it. You will not be required to use anything that's not already in Zybooks, though. Delete. I can delete an element from a list using the del, D-E-L, keyword. I can also delete a whole list using the del keyword. The difference in the two is that if I want to delete an element in a list, I use the square brackets and the number of the index associated with the element I want to delete. If I don't use the square brackets, I delete the entire list. I just wipe it out of the program. So let's just do some quick list basics. And in fact, to save a little time tonight, I'm not going to go through all my, all my pretty slides. Um, because I do want to spend more time on, where is it, on this. This is, I want to go over this with you guys and actually run through it, because this gives you the framework for this week's project 
and your final project. It is not the answer, it is not the end all and be all, but it gives you a starting framework for it. And I think that's important because we really give you a lot of stuff to learn in this class and it's not always easy to learn. And yes, this will be up on the YouTube site. So rather than going through the, unless you guys want to, if you guys want to look at the pretty slides, we will look at the pretty slides. Other than that, we will run through the code. And absolutely, if you've got a preference, please, please put it in the, um, sorry, please put it in the comments. And actually, okay. So we're going to run starting with 6.11. Okay, uh, module six, there we go. So basically 6.11 basically is teaching you how to manipulate a list. That's what it's asking you to do. Somebody's going to enter a comma separate, a list of strings. A comma is separating each of the elements in the strings. We are using the split method to turn that into a list. And we have done that previously in the class. Then we're going to get rid of something, we're going to add something, we're going to change something. So I'm going to debug this because we all know I like the debugger. And I'm on the user input. So I'm just going to input, uh, hold on, Joe and Mary and Sam. So I have Joe and Mary and Sam. And the split has created, and let's go back and look at our frames and variables, specifically our variables. That split statement, splitting on the comma, so it gets rid of the comma, but that's where it breaks for the list, created a list with Joe and Mary and Sam. So the first thing I want to do is I want to get rid of Joe. So I am going to step over del name, so del will modify a list. Because I am using the square brackets and an index number, it's going to modify that element and that element only in the list. So if I step over, I see that my list is now three elements. It had been four. Oh, I have spaces. Anyway, that's okay. It had been four but now it is three elements because I removed Joe. So I'm going to say length. The length is three. And I'm going to say length of one, length minus one is Joe. So I have the name of my list, names. I have an open square bracket. I have a closed square bracket. And I have length minus one. So length is the length of names. And if I want the last element, because with all lists, the first, the index of the first element is zero. If I want to get change the last element, it's always length minus one, because we start at zero. And then I'm going to print it. So that is just simple list manipulation. Okay, let's go back here and methods. So there are lots of methods on a list, a whole lot. Right now, I'm just giving you four, and that's because some of these you're going to have to use in the labs this week. Count counts the number of items with the value of x, whatever x is. Sort sorts in alphabetical order. Append adds an element to the end of the list, and reverse reverses the order of the sort. So you have sort and reverse. Sort is alphabetically, reverse is reverse alphabetically. And this is 6.2.1. So let's just go and look at 6.2.1. OK. Where is it? Six, six, two, one. 
Okay, so this is just another quick, uh, and it's based on Challenge 621. That's why it's named like that. Come on, computer. All right, I don't know why my computer's being like this. Hold on. Okay, hopefully that's big enough for everyone to see. So, um, come on. I don't know what's wrong with this. Hold on. I don't know what's wrong with PyCharm on my computer. Let's bring this back up. Everything's fine there. PyCharm. All right. Okay, okay. Let's just close that and open it again. Now my mouse is working, but my trying to make it bigger isn't. That's just weird. Close this one more time. Open it. I apologize. I can't seem to work. Up oh, there it is. Okay, so here what we're going to do is we're going to input some data, and we're going to sort some names in one order and then we're going to reverse sort them in the other. And this is just to demonstrate what sort and reverse do. And if you're if you come up with a lab that says you have to sort and reverse, this is the challenge you want to go to. So, let us debug. I'm going to got no variables. I'm on the console. I'm going to put in Joe and Sam, Mary, and Gertrude. So I'm going to step over, and I have Joe and Sam, Mary, and Gertrude. I'm going to split. Whoops, hold on. I'm not splitting right. Okay. So let me start this again because I didn't tell it to split on a comma. I told it to split on a space. So let me do that again. Joe and Mary, Sam, Gertrude. And I didn't spell Gertrude right, but that's okay. So I have Joe and Mary, Sam, and Gertrude. I'm going to split them into a list. That provides me with my happy list here. So I have five elements in the list. I'm going to sort it, which is going to sort it on alphabetic. It's going to sort it alphabetically. So when I step over that, now let's look at my variables here, and I have names. When I step over that sort, Python automatically gives me back my list in alphabetical order. Very quick. So I'm going to output the names to the console. Now I'm going to reverse it. So let's see. Let's take a look at names. And you'll see that it, Python has modified the names list for Sam, Mary, Joe, jo, Gertrude, and Anne. So that's what sort and reverse do. And again, there are a massive amount of functions out there for lists and dictionaries in Python. If you think you have to write something to do something to a list, go out and look on the Internet first and see what Python already has for you. Um, I've actually seen students go out and try and write their own sort algorithm. You can do that, but it's not necessary. So we'll stop this. And we'll jump back here. Okay. So, loops and lists. This um, is 633. Actually, I'm going to go through this one because I think it's important. So we're going to do this one visually with this. So basically, you're going to loop that prints all of the elements in hourly temperature, and those are just some numbers that you've um, entered in, and you're going to separate them with a dash and a greater than sign. And then you're going to surround it by spaces. And this one becomes somewhat important because you don't want that. After the last number, you don't want the, the dash or the greater than sign. 
So I'm going to input some data, which I just did, 90, 92, 94, and 95. I'm going to split it. Remember, when you're using split and there's nothing in between the parentheses, it assumes the space. Now I'm going to go through this, and I'm not going to just go through the list. This time, I'm going to get the length, and I'm going to use range. And that is because I want to I want this to behave differently on the very last element in the list. So I have four index in range, and then this range is just going to give me the numbers 0 through 3. So I'm going to print the hourly temp, and I don't want to end it with a new line. I want to end it with a space. So remember, I've got that end equal quote space quote there. Now, here's where the difference is. I want to make sure if it's not the last element in the list, then I'm going to print my arrow. If it is, I'm not. So here, I'm going to print out 90, and then I'm going to print my arrow. And then I'm going to print out 92, and I'm going to print my arrow. And then I'm going to print out 94, and I'm going to print my arrow. And lastly, I'm going to print out 95, and the program is going to end. That is why I have that if statement in there, and that's specifically why I'm going over the, the I'm using the indexes to get at the elements in the list, and that is so I can determine when I want to put that arrow and when I don't. Um, so this we're going to slow down a little bit on, because this is our first foray into what we call multidimensional lists. Everything we've done so far with lists has been flat. You've got a string, you've got a list of things, but a multidimensional list is essentially a list of other lists. And visually, you can think of this as like a spreadsheet. In fact, spreadsheets came out of multidimensional lists. They have, um, well, let me, let me start again. For a multidimensional list, every dimension requires, if you're going through that list, every dimension requires its own for loop. So in this case, I have a two-dimensional matrix. And that means I'm going to have two for loops, one nested inside of the other. So if we use the example here, I've got a header row. We will ignore the header row for our data processing. But I have um, columns and I have rows. So I have a column which is January, a column which is February, a column which is March 1, but I also have rows. I didn't put numbers, and I probably should have. But we have a row, which is the first row, which has 10, 20, and 30. The second row has 40, 50, and 60. And the third row has 70, 80, and 90. The trick to working with multidimensional lists is you, you want to get to the data in a cell. Up till now, we've just had a square bracket, some number, and a, and a square bracket, and we can get it, the data we want. That becomes more complex right now. Right now, we're going to have to have two lists because we actually have two dimensions. And, um, and we are actually going to have multiple lists. That's what a multidimensional list is. So if I look at my spreadsheet and I have 10, 20, and 30, I'm actually going to have a list, which is 10, 20, and 30. And it's going to be inside of, it's going to be an element of my multi-list, which is just, it's just a variable name. And you'll notice that my multi-list has an opening square bracket and a closing square bracket. The first list, my 10, 20, 30 row, also has opening square brackets and closing square brackets. So for the first element of my multi-list, I have added a list. 
so it's a multi-dimensional list. A comma tells me that I'm going to add something else. Now I have my next row, and that's 40, 50, 60. I have a comma, and I'm going to have my final row, which is 70, 80, 90. So I have created a two-dimensional list. That two-dimensional list has an outer list, and it has three inner lists. And to get at the data, I'm going to have to go through the outer list and then through that first row, and then back up to the outer list and through the second row, and back up to the outer list and do the third row. So this is the concept and the syntax. OK, so um, excuse me. This says print the two-dimensional list multi-table by row and column. So I'm going to input some numbers, 1, 2, 3, comma, 2, 4, 6, comma, 3, 6, 9. And I'm going to split it by commas, which gives me a single list with three strings. But I don't want a single list with three strings. I want a single list with three lists. So what I do is I create an empty list called table. And then that table's just the place that it's going to hold it. Now I need to create that in the global scope of this script. Because if I don't, I can't get to it later. So I'm going to define table outside of my for loop. And the, this original for loop, it's a one-dimensional loop. And that's because I have a flat list currently. I have rows, and rows is flat. It's not multidimensional. There are not lists inside the rows list. But I'm going to make it so that table has lists as its elements. And that's what this for loop does. So this for loop basically goes and it counts. Um, it says for row counter in range len rows. So I've got rows, and I'm going to get the, each element of rows, and I'm going to do something with it. Well, what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to split it. And I'm going to split, I just rows of row counter dot split. So I've split the string one space two space three into one comma two comma three. So I've created a list. And then I have an empty, another empty list called row, and that's just going to be, um, Sorry, and that's just going to be kind of a, a throwaway. And now I have another list. I have another, sorry, for loop inside. And basically for every single cell, I'm going to go through and create and add an element to the row. So I want to say um, cell counter in range lens cells, and then I'm just going to append the cell. And I'm going to do this until I have all of the stuff in my tables. And then I'm going to print it out. And this is in the wrong order. I apologize. So I'm actually going to stop this. And we are going to go through this one in uh, sorry. No. OK. We're going to go through this one in PyCharm. So 651. So and, and this is this is how you deal with a matrix. And it does seem complex, but once you get the rhythm down of how to do multidimensional lists, they're all the same. So let's do this. Whoops, no, nope, that's not what I want. Um So I'm going to put in some data, and then we're going to split it, and we'll go from there. So we have frames and variables and console. So I'm going to debug, because we all know I like to debug. And so this one I'm going to put in, what was it? It was one, whoops, two, three, three, four, five. And four, five, six. 
So I've put in three strings that are separated by commas. Oops, I didn't want to do that. And I'm going to hit the Enter key. So you will see that rows is 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 4, 5, 6. I've created an empty table called table. So I'm going to be in my variables here. Table has nothing in it. So for my outer row, basically what I'm doing is I am saying for row in range, len rows. And so this, all of this right here is about populating table so I can do something with it later. So there are two sets of things. This populates the table, this first set of for loops, and the second one outputs things from the table. And this is also important to get to begin to get to um, understand that sometimes you have to populate and then do things with it because we're going to do that next week with files. So I am going to say I have a row counter. Row counter is just going to be from zero to the number two because I only have three elements in my list. So I'm going to say the value of the cells in my row are going to be row of row counter dot split. So I did that wrong. Let me start again. I did that wrong. Okay. Let me let me start this again. I put in my data wrong. Okay. So it's going to be one, two, three, comma, comma, four, five, six. Now let's do it right. Okay. I, I had put quotes around it, and that was messing everything up. Because I want these to be numbers. So we're back to cells. Cells is simply a list made from the first string in my rows. So cells right now is going to be one, two, three. Oh, sorry. Rows right now. Um, the row of row counter is one, two, three. So I'm going to split it, and now I have cells. We can see down here in the variables, which is one, two, three. And so I'm going to create another throwaway variable. Row is a throwaway variable. I'm going to use it to hold some stuff, and then I'm going to use it again later. But it's the data doesn't matter. It's only there for a very short period of time. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go through this table called cells, and I'm going to change the type of my data into an integer, and then I'm going to add it to this temporary list called row. And then when I'm all done, that row, which is in fact a list, is going to be appended to my table list. So let's see how that works. So I've, I'm inside, all of this is in the local scope of this for loop. Additionally, there is another for loop. This is the second for loop because this is a two-dimensional list. Two-dimensional list means two loops. So I'm going to say for cell counter in range len cells. So I want to get the index for each individual element in my list. So cell counter is zero, which means cell of cell counter is going to be one. So I'm going to take one and I'm going to turn it into an integer. And then I'm going to append it to row. So if we take a look at row right here, as I step over that line of code, you will see that that becomes one. Now, you'll notice I have gone back up to my inner for loop. Why have I done that? That has happened because I'm not finished with the loop yet. Python will go through an inner loop until it's completely done with that loop. And then, only then, will it go back to the outer loop. Now, done with can mean a couple of things. It means that you simply don't have any more data to process. It could be that 
you've said continue. So you're going to, um, sorry, you said break. So you're going to go break out of that inner loop and you're going to go back up to the top. So let us step over this again. And you'll notice row down here is about to change with a two and with a three. So now my cell counter is two. I only had three elements in the list, so that's the highest it can be. So for this particular list, the inner list, I'm done. So what I want to do is I am now, Python's going to say, yeah, you're done. So now I step out of that inner list, so that inner loop, and I'm now going to append row to table. Well, row is a list of integers. And if you look here at table, when I step over, table changes. So now I have, table is now a two-dimensional list. I have an outer list, which is table, and then I have this inner list, which is another list of data. So now I'm going to go and do that again, because I have two more um, lists inside my rows. So I did this one and I turned it in to this. So now I'm going to do 345 and turn it into another list with 345. So I, I'm not stepping out of the outer loop. The outer loop is just keeping doing what it's doing. So I'm going to step over and you will see that when I say cells equals row of row counter dot split, row counter is now one this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to get 3, 4, 5. So I got 3, 4, 5. Now, row had data in it. But when I reassign it right here, it's going to empty it out. It's going to blank that. Anything that's in there is going away. Boom. It's gone. So now I'm going to do the same thing again. This time again, I'm working with cells, but cells is now three, four, five. So I'm going to step over, and I'm, as you'll notice, rows here, sorry, row here, right here, has three, it's about to have a four, and it's about to have a five. So cell counter is two, which means I'm done with that particular list. And now I've got a row with three, four, five in it, and I'm going to append it to table. Okay, so do I still have more elements in rows that I haven't evaluated? Well, the answer is yes, I have four, five, six. So I'm still not done with this outer loop. So the row counter is two. Cells is now going to be set to three, four, five, or sorry, four, five, six. Row is going to be blanked out again. Okay, it's going to go back to empty. And then I'm going to now go through my 4, 5, 6 list. So 4, 5, and 6 are now added to row. I am done with this inner list because I'm done. There's nothing else left to do. So now I'm going to append that 4, 5, 6 list to table. And now it goes back up to the top of that outer loop, and I'm done because my row counter is 2, and there are no more, there's no more data to process. So now what you'll see is I have this thing called table here. Whoops. I didn't know I could do that. I have table. Table is a multidimensional list. Table contains three elements, those three elements are lists, and I've got to get at the data inside each of those lists for the next part, which basically means I'm going to print a number and then a pipe symbol until I'm at the end of the list, and then I'm going to print a new line. So here I'm going to do for row in table. That's what I want to get first. Because, again, it's a two-dimensional list, so i got to have two loops. The outer loop is going to look at table. 
So when the outer loop is looking at table, what it sees is it sees three lists. It doesn't see one, two, three. It doesn't three, see three, four, five. It doesn't see four, five, six. It sees a table with three elements. I also noticed here I'm not doing the whole thing with index. I'm just getting whatever the element is out of table. And I call these rows and columns because for me it makes sense. You're dealing with a row and then you're trying to get to the cell that's in that column. So for row, so if I look at row, row is now one, two, three. And I might, I think I might have made this a little more difficult than I had to because this row is not the same as this row. This row only existed here in this loop. This row only exists here in this loop. So I just saw that. So if that's confusing, I apologize. So I'm going to say for index comma cell in enumerate row. This is a new one. Enumerate basically says give me the index and the value. I want them both. Python allows us to do this with a function called enumerate. So it's going to say, okay, give me the value of the cell, which is going into cell, and give me the index at it, 0, 1, or 2 in this case. So in this case, it's going to be 0. So what I'm going to get is, let me do this. I'm going to put this up here and index and cell. Where is cell? Uh, ah, there it is. So table, index, and cell are right up here at the top. So first of all, I want to check and see whether or not it's the last element in this particular row. Because if it's not the last element, then I'm going to uh, put a pipe in between them. And if it is, then I'm going to just do a new line. So I'm going to say if index is not length of row minus 1, which it won't be at this point because it's 0. So I'm going to print the cell value, a pipe, and a space. So that comes out like that. And then I am now, because again, this is the inner loop. I'm going to go through every item in row. So I'm going to go through every item in row. So I just did one. Now I'm going to do two. And now I'm going to do three. Now three is the last one. So it's going to just print cell and a new line. And then I'm going to go, Python's going to go back up to the loop. It's going to say, okay, I have an index of two. I only had three elements, so I'm stopping this one, and I'm going back up to the outer loop. So now we're going to do it again. And in this case, we're going to do it, row has changed to 3, 4, 5. So we're going to do the same thing for 3, 4, 5. And I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to print a cell, and this is what the console is looking like. I am now at index of 2 again for the second list inside table. And I'm going to go up to the outer loop. And now my row is 4, 5, and 6. So I'm going to do the same thing. 4, 5, 6. It's going to print cell. And it's going to go up to that inner loop. And it's going to say, I'm at index 2. There's nothing more to do. So I'm now going to go back up to the outer loop. There are no more rows in table, and I will be done. So that is what, that's how you deal with a multidimensional list. And please ask questions if you need to. Um, so we are now headed into the new stuff, the brand, brand new stuff, which is dictionaries. And I know we're going to run late tonight, and I apologize if anybody can't stay. Okay, so dictionaries are an associative container. What does that mean? That means there's no index. Dictionaries have absolutely no concept of an index value. 
What a dictionary has are key value pair. A key is just a unique identifier in a dictionary. That's all it is. The value is a piece of data that you want to store. So you have an identifier. You get to name the identifier. The identifier could be one. The identifier could be the word age or the word name or the word room. Um, and anything can be a key or value. So I can have a key called room one and a value that's a dictionary that has maybe other rooms and directions and things like that in it. Dictionaries are unordered. It does not have a concept of an index. Lists have indexes. Dictionaries have key value pairs. They are completely separate. So how do we deal with this stuff about a dictionary? Well, dictionaries have curly brackets. When Python sees a curl, an open curly bracket, it's expecting a dictionary, and it's also expecting a corresponding closing curly bracket. And this is just a sample dictionary. I have a variable called mydict. We know it's a, we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign, I have a populated dictionary. Each element in the dictionary has is a key value pair. So there are three separate key value pairs in the dictionary. I have name, which is Lisa, I have age, which is 42, and I have amount, which is 3.14. So, key value, name, Lisa, age, 42, and amount, 3.14. That's what my dictionary has. Now, if you've ever dealt with no SQL databases, they are, in fact, dictionaries. So, we can still do CRUD on a dictionary. Create, read, update, delete. We can create a dictionary, by sim an empty one, by simply having a variable on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. We have an opening and closing parentheses. On, we can also create a populated dictionary, like we saw on the previous slide. Read, how do we get at stuff from a dictionary if there's no index value? We get at the stuff by giving it the key. The key is what gets you to the data. The data is the value. So how do I do that? I give it the key, whatever the key is. So if I say print my underscore dict, open square brace, the word name, close square brace, close parenthesis, I am telling Python, whatever the value is in my dictionary for the key name, print it out. I can update, I can change it, just like I could um, change the value of a list if I gave it the index. I can change the value of a dictionary if I give it the key. I can also add information to the end of a dictionary by using the append function. The append function takes as its argument a, a key and it ta and and you equal it to a value delete you can delete an element in the dictionary sorry you can delete the whole dictionary you can't delete an element in the dictionary all right so iterating over a dictionary let us again i'm going to do this in pycharm because I am really trying not to keep you guys here forever. That was six dot, oh, wait a minute. Do I not have that up there? I'll have to put that up there for you guys. I'm sorry. We'll go through this. So this is challenge 6.16.1, and it's write a loop that prints each country's population in country pop. So basically what we're doing is we're going to create a dictionary of countries and their population. This is flat, this is not nested yet. So, user is going to input some stuff. Uh, Professor Lisa is going to input this weird stuff, which is C colon 136, I colon 124, 
U.S. colon 318 and O colon 252. So first of all, I have to turn this string into a dictionary. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to split it on a comma because that's the first thing I can use. And then I have four strings. Each of those four strings is going to be turned into a dictionary entry. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a dictionary called country underscore pop. It is an empty dictionary. And then I'm going to say four pair in entries. So entries is my list, because that's all entries is, is it just a list. I'm going to use a for loop over the entries list to get at the strings, because that's what they are right now, in that list. So what do I want to do? Well, first of all, I want to split pair so I have two different values. And the way I do that, as always, is to use the split function. And in this case, I'm going to split it on a colon. So that gives me a list. In this case, it's C and 136. So I have um, a list with two elements. And then what I want to do is I want to take the first element in that list which is C, I want to turn that into the key, and then I want to take the second element in that list, and I want to make it the value. Well, how do I do that? Well, I know how to get at the first value and the second value from the split pair list. So I simply say country pop, which Python already knows is a dictionary. I use my open square bracket, close square bracket, and then I have split underscore pair of zero. So that is going to be the key the value is going to be split underscore pair of one. And so that will create the key value pair. And what I will have is I'll have a country pop dictionary with C and 136. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. I'm going to do it for the next pair. So that's I and 124. That's going to create another entry in the dictionary. So now I have two entries. I have C colon 136, and I have a value I colon, sorry, a key I and a value of 124. Now I'm going to do it for the third one. US and 318, same thing. And then I'm going to do it for the fourth one. And we have our list of countries and populations. Of course, we can't leave it there. We always have to do one more thing. So now I'm going to print it out. So what I want to do is I want to loop over the dictionary. So how do I loop over the dictionary? I can use a for loop. I can use a function called dot items, and it will get me both the key and the value. So the for loop that I have here and by the way, this is not nested. This is a completely separate for loop. I have four country comma pop. It could have been Fred and Wilma because they're just variable names. Country and pop are just variable names. In is our normal keyword that says I'm going to be doing something with a collection. The collection I'm doing something with is called country underscore pop. It was created in the previous for loop. And I have a dot items. Dot items is a function that's there. You can use it on dictionaries. Python gives it to you. And what it will do is it will return the key and the value. So that's what I've done in that one line of code. So I will print country has pop people. Oops. Okay. So I didn't show you all the output of that, but that's what that is. So now, um, here's where dictionaries become very important for you. You are going to have to use a dictionary in this week's project and in the final project. That dictionary is going to keep your, it's going to keep for you what room can travel 
to what other room based on a direction. So what you'll see here is you will see I have a dictionary called rooms. That dictionary called rooms is made up of, oh, my syntax is wrong. I apologize. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm missing a curly bracket. I apologize. And actually, the better way to do this, we're going to look at this. Okay, I'll make this as big as I can. So, this is, I have a dictionary called rooms. And this is the structure that you're going to have to use for your project this week and your game next week. Now, this is not the answer. You can't just drop this in. Um, but what I have here is I have a game. And that game has three rooms, and I have four directions, up, down, right, and left. And I need to go from one room to another using only those four directions. Well, how do I do that? How do I do that and not write a massive amount of code? And how do I do it so maybe I want to add another room? I do that making my code data-driven and using a dictionary of dictionaries. So here's what I have. What you will see here is I have a dictionary called rooms, okay? That's my outer dictionary. In my inner, so for every element in rooms, I have a key. In this case, it's room one. And I have a value. That value is, in fact, another dictionary. Now, in that other dictionary, my keys are directions. And my value is the room that I will go based on that direction. So I have from, I can be read like this. From room one, if I go up, I end up in room two. From room two, if I go down, I end up in room one. Or if I go right, I end up in room three. From room three, if I go left, I end up in room two. That's how you read this dictionary. And this will give you the entire map of your game. So if you have created a game with eight rooms, you're going to have eight keys, one for each room name. And then you're going to have, as the value, a dictionary. And any direction you can take from that room will be the key, and the value will be the room that you can get to when you go to the direction. So if you go north, and you're in the Great Hall, and you go north, and you end up in the dungeon, then that would be Great Hall, North, Dungeon. So this is a basic structure for your game, and it's fair, because so I give it to anybody who looks at the videos. Um, and I'm going, I just have my little list of direction here just so I can check things easily because maybe I want to say, because maybe your, your teacher Lisa will do this, and yes, she will. I will put in A, B, C, D, E for a direction and see whether or not it tells me it's an invalid direction or if the program just kind of flops over and dies. So you want something like this to basically say, that, um, yeah, you want this to basically say that these are the directions I have, so it's an easy check. Now, I'm not going to go over the room instructions, and I'm not, I am going to go over in room, and I am going to go over the gameplay loop. So, we want to know how to move from one room to the other. Well, if we think about it, we have to have a concept of a current room, okay? wherever the player currently is. If you are playing, you know, a zombies game and your player is in the living room and they need to move to the dining room, what direction do they move? Do they make a right-hand turn? Do they make a left-hand turn? Do they jump over the zombies? Who knows? But you have to be able to move that player. The same happens in a text-based game. You have to be able to move the player. 
The way you move the player is to say, I have a room and I have a direction. How do I get, you know, where, where does this take me? If I'm in room one and the direction is up, then my new current room is room two. And that's what I would return here. Okay? So where two is just rooms of my current room. So if I want, I've got room one, and I want to know everything I can do from room one, I'm glad you came to the meeting too, Joshua. This will be up tomorrow. I know that this is a long lecture. Um, so I want to know everything I can do from room one. And I'm doing that by getting the dictionary because this dictionary is going to contain everything. So I now where to is just a dictionary. And it's the dictionary associated with what I can do when I'm trying to move from room one. First of all, I want to make sure if direct, the direction, is not in where to, then invalid input. So I could say A, B, C, D, E. I could say down, and there's no down from room two, so that would be invalid. And then I'm always, just, I've always got to return a room. So I'm either, if it's invalid, I'm going to return the current room I'm in. If it's not invalid, I'm going to move. I'm going to return where to which is just my dictionary, of the direction. So just like we did in that other lab, this is what we're doing here. Now let's go down to the gameplay loop. The gameplay loop is important, okay? First of all, I gotta have my, my test value. I gotta have my stop is not Q. By the way, if you're in my class, one of the things I test is a way to get out of the game. So you gotta have the ability to exit, you gotta have the ability to quit, something like that. Okay, so I'm going to print out my instructions and I'm going to wait for user input. If the user inputs Q, quit, exit, whatever you want to make it, I'm going to break. Then I'm going to check the direction itself to make sure that evil Professor Lisa did not put in A, B, C, D, E. If it's not valid, I'm going to continue, which is going to take me up to the top of the loop, get more user input. Now, I have a current room equal room one, current room equal in room, room one, user input. So the user input is the direction. I know where I currently am, and I want to know where I'm going to go, and that's what current room does. And then I just keep rolling along like this. Now, this game doesn't have, we're not gathering inventory, we're not doing any of those things that you're going to have to do in your main game. But this gets you the main gameplay loop, and it helps you understand how you work with the dictionaries and the list. They are critical when writing your game. Okay, the, the, This dictionary is going to be massively critical. The gameplay loop is critical. And how you get from one place to the other is critical. So there are three critical things here. If you can get those three things, you're going to do okay on the game. So I promise I will, let me, let me go back to my lecture because I do want to go over the labs and I know I'm running long tonight and I apologize for that. So 6.12, varied amount of input data pseudocode. So a user inputs a string with numbers. Um, the user, you know, Sets tokens, so we're going to split. We're just somebody's going to enter numbers with spaces, and we're going to split those into a list. Now I have to convert my string to integers. So I'm going to create an empty list in this. Whoops, my bad. I'm going to create an empty list called input data, and then I'm going to populate that data much like we did in the other list. Um, yeah, in the list challenges, I'm going to input my data, 
I'm going to, sorry, convert my data to an integer and append it to my input data list. Now I'm going to do something else. So I want to get the average and the max. So I'm going to do a calculation on the data and definitely take a look at the built-in functions um, for lists and iterating over lists because basically you won't have to do much. Because basically you're just going to call sum on the list. On input data you're going to call the function sum and then you're going to divide it by the length and that's going to get you the average value. And then max, you're going to call the max function and you're going to output average and max. So this one really is about taking your input data and manipulating it properly to get a list of integers. And this is flat. This is not a multidimensional. This, however, um, so this is still flat. So you're again going to enter strings with numbers and you're going to split them. And then you're going to set input data equals to an empty list. And if it's greater than zero, then you're going to add it to your input data. And then you're going to sort it. So you're going to sort it. Um, and then make sure the end of the input comment, make sure to end the output with a space. And then you're just going to print out your values separated by a space. The important part here is you create it properly and you sort it and you make sure there are no zeros in it. Word frequencies. This is where you're going to use count. So the user is going to input a value and you're, um, you're going to split the user input into a user sentence. And then you're basically just going to do a for loop over that sentence and you're going to say output user sentence and the count of the user sentence. That's all you're going to do. So this is very short and this is where you're going to use that count function. I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, no, there's one more. Replacement words. Okay. So I'm going to, this is one with a dictionary. So I'm going to create an empty dictionary and I'm going to input some words and I'm going to split the words based on spaces. So now I have to do something with it. So now I have to put the words into a dictionary. So I want key value pairs, and I want all of the even, and zero here is an even, uh, elements to be the keys, and I want the odds to be the value. So that's what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to roll through this list, and I'm going to make sure that I'm incrementing it by two. And then when I have my dictionary, um, and I'm going to grab a sentence from the input. We're going to input into something. And then I'm going to do a word replacement. I'm going to say for a ridge word, new word, in word pairs. Oh, I should have said, oh, yeah, word pairs is the empty dictionary. Sorry about that. And then I'm just going to do the word replacement. I'm going to replace the original word with the new word in the user sentence, and then I'm going to output the user sentence. So this basically is very much, very similar to the one we did with the um, countries and the population. I know that was a whole lot of information. Does anybody have any questions? Um, we can open it up, we can run through some things, or is everybody completely just done? Either is fine. Okay, so I'll do my going once, going twice, everybody's done. Okay, this will be up tomorrow. And um, on the YouTube channel, and if you're in my class, please reach out to me if you have any questions. Everybody have a good evening.